Hello everyone, I'm Becky Goldsmith with Piece of Cake and thank you for taking a time out with me today. Before I hit go, I was practicing which way to lean to show you that quilt. And it's this way. So that quilt behind me while I'm remembering is Tree of Life. And it's, it's, it's bigger. There's a bottom to it below and a border above that's different from the borders on the sides. That is from our book, Applique Outside the Lines which is a fun book. It's out of print, but the ebook is available at peaceocake.com. And the, the fun thing about the book is it's one where there are patterns. So there's a pattern for this in there and some other quilts, but it's one where we talk about how you can ignore the patterns, which is great because sometimes when you're doing applique, you want to change things. So it's a book with patterns that explains how to ignore the patterns cool, right? Okay, the other thing I want to tell you today before I get into scissors is um, that today is my youngest grandchild's eighth birthday, Bear. So Bear belongs to my son Chris and his wife Lorna. A lot of you guys know Lorna. So Chris and Lorna have taken Bear on an outing. They went out of town yesterday to a cabin and they're hiking today and they might be on their way back by now. So Lorna is not manning the chat, but Bear's other grandmother, Lorna's mom, Judy, who, just in case you didn't know, Judy ships most of the orders now, so Judy may know you without you really knowing her. Judy is manning the chat, so be nice to Judy. You might even say, hi, Judy. Um, okay, now, what I'm talking about today is scissors. And I made myself a note so I wouldn't forget this thought. Scissors are a tool, just like hammers and screwdrivers. And I know my husband has way more than one hammer, and each one of his hammers does something different, and the same thing is true of screwdrivers. And I have to tell you, I've gotten to be kind of particular about screwdriver bits myself. So in the same way that traditionally men have tools where they might have the same kind of tool, but a whole bunch of different times, scissors are like that for us. So in this first little bit, I want to show you a collection of the scissors that I use really often. And this isn't even all my scissors. Scissors are really great tools. And I have a lot of them. And these are the ones I use most often. I do actually have more scissors than this, but these are ones that I can recommend and that I sell on my site because I like all of them. And they each have a job. Most of these are serrated and some are not. So those four are not serrated and these are. I'm guessing most of you know that serrated scissors have one blade that has little bitty serrations on it, little bitty teeth, and one smooth blade. I've said this in many videos, but I'll say it again here. When you have serrated scissors, cut with the smooth blade on the bottom of the cut, because as you cut forward with the scissor, and then you move the scissor forward, the freshest end of the cut will glide along that bottom blade. And if that's the one with the teeth, it's, it's harder to move your scissor forward. It wants to catch. My serrated scissors all have a scissor charm. Always find the serrated blade, follow it down, put the scissor charm on that grip, because when you use your scissors, you'll want the scissor charm to dangle off the bottom of your hand. All that does is make it easier to identify at a glance how to pick up the scissors. Why would you want to use serrated scissors? It's because if you're using smooth scissors on fabric, 
as you cut forward, the fabric, it's like it scoots out from between the blades. And when one of those blades has serrations or little teeth, it helps to hold the fabric in the scissor and it makes you more accurate when you cut. So they're nice. I, I use my serrated scissors mostly for fabric, but I also use this scissor right here. This is a, an embroidery scissor that is serrated and I like this scissor for paper. I like all of these scissors here. This is Karen K. Buckley's craft scissor. This is the Elan embroidery scissor and this is Omni Grid's uh, little pointy scissor. It's actually made by Kai. These, these would be scissors I would use for paper. Only one of them is serrated, but it's the one I tend to pick up the most these days. Okay, so one of the things I didn't specifically talk about there is the length of the blade and why it matters. So this is my Kai Professional Scissor that's, I think it's five and three quarters, somewhere between five and a half and six inches. And it's got a nice blade that is long without being too long. When you are cutting with scissors, think about what it does to your hand, right? So if you're cutting scissors with little bitty short, short blades, if you're trying to cut something long, you have to open and close your hands a lot. So it's it's a hand issue in addition to if you're trying to cut longer cuts like I use these when I'm cutting out bigger pieces or when I'm doing cutting out lots and lots of applique pieces not just one but you know I'm cutting out a block's worth I want a scissor that is not going to wear my hand out but one that as I'm cutting the blade itself is helping me hold the fabric up so it's less stressful all the way around on my hand. So all those scissors I showed you, they have different lengths of blades, which is yet again another thing I consider when I'm choosing one scissor over another. Okay, now I want to talk to you about how scissors work because you you kind of know how scissors work, but you know, there's more. Here we go. Whether your scissors are smooth or serrated, they all work the same way. There are two blades that are screwed together, and that is the pivot point. There's grips for your fingers, and then the blade. How thick the blades are, how long the blades are, how the grips are uh, shaped, that varies from scissor to scissor. When you open a pair of scissors and put fabric between the blades, you can only see the top blade. And it's on the right side of the cut. Most of us are right-handed. And that means when we cut, it's really easy to see what we're doing. If you are left-handed cutting with right-handed scissors, you can't see the cutting edge of the blade. It makes it so much harder. The other thing that happens if you are left-handed cutting with right-handed scissors, and you've always been left-handed cutting with right-handed scissors, it's a thing you may not be that much aware of. But right-handers, when we're cutting, we often pull back just a little bit against this blade, against the top blade, to tighten the cut as you go forward. If you've ever had scissors that sprung, you know what I mean here. You can, you can make the blades come closer together by the way you subtly grip the handle. Left-handers, if you do that, I'm not sure it has that same effect. 
I, I have a feeling that that's another downside to cutting left-handed with right-handed scissors. You can get true left-handed scissors, but if you do that and you have been trained initially to cut with right-handed scissors, what you need to do is close the scissor without putting undue torque on the blades because it doesn't work the same way. That's as complicated as I can get as a right-hander trying to help a left-handed cutter. Okay. I, I know, I know that there's not that many left-handers in the population, but I can't help it. I, I, why does it say, oh, you know what? I'm going to take that off. <laughs> it was there. I, I will see you next Wednesday, but that shouldn't have been there. So, um, what was I saying? Oh, I know what I was saying. Left-handers, you're a smaller part of the population, but you're there and I feel your pain and I really feel it for left-handers trying to cut with right-handed scissors because it is so hard to see. One of the things I did realize as I was watching the video that I made, right, I made the video, is that those of us who are right-handed, you know when you torque the scissor blades together, actually you're pushing forward with your thumb and pulling back with your fingers to pull those blades together. It's a weird thing. Now, why would you have to do that? I mean, your scissors should not be sprung, right? Don't drop your scissors. So my very fine scissors, I've dropped them on the concrete here a couple of times. I probably need to send them in to be uh, tightened at Kai. Protect your scissors. Do your best not to drop them on the floor because that can cause them to um, have issues. All right. The next thing I want to talk to you about is clipping inner points because that is actually the question that was sent in that got me to thinking about talking about this in the first place because how scissors work is directly tied into when you make clips. Here we go. I have written in many of my books and posted many videos on how to sew an inner point. So I'm not going to go into those details here. I am going to say that when you clip an inner point, if you want a point and not a round, you will need to make your clip to and through the line centered exactly on that point. When you put your scissors in to clip, you really must remember where the cut happens. The cut happens where the blades meet. So that is, for right-handed scissors, on the left side of the top blade. Most of the time, when people put their scissors into uh, an inner point to clip, they look at the blade and center the whole blade. And if I were to close my scissors here, my clip would be well to the left of where I want it to be. I would need to move my scissors farther to the right so that my cut is actually going to happen where I want it to happen. I wanted to begin showing you that with my bigger professional scissors because the blades are longer and they're thicker. So while I can see where to make the cut, I typically use, when I'm clipping anything, I use my smaller professional scissors because the blade is so much narrower. Even if I slightly misjudge where the left side of the top blade is, it's so much easier to see because the blade itself is narrower. There are other really fine scissors that also work to clip inner points. 
This is a pair of Karen K. Buckley's Smaller Perfect Scissors. The blade is a little thicker, but it's not as thick as my first scissor that I showed you. But it's easy to see where the left side of the top blade is. So I sometimes use this scissor. The OmniGrid, tiny little OmniGrid scissor, has a blade very similar to the professional scissor. So it works. In all of these demonstrations, I put my scissor in and I've, I've almost closed it as I gauge where the clip will be. This time I'll cut. And there it is, to and through the line, dead center. <laughs> now, as I said, this, this today is not about how to sew an inner point. I do have a video, probably more than one, that you can go and find. The most recent one on how to hand applique an inner point that is not part of one of my classes would be on Creative Spark. So go to creativespark.ctpub.com. That's where all of my video classes are, where if you want more, <laughs> that's where you get more. Um, but the Searching for Beauty Quilt, which is a free pattern that I, free set, free class with pattern, um, you can find it on Creative Spark, and one of those lessons is how to hand applique an inner point. Um, not in huge detail, but in pretty decent detail. So you can find that there. Uh, next, I want to talk to you about outer curves. Because people clip outer curves, and I think they should not. So here we go. The thing that happens on outer curves, and I haven't even started sewing this, I'm just manufacturing the problem for you to see. But what happens is people are sewing along and then instead of turning under one stitch at a time, they want to turn under a bunch, just like that. And when you do that, you get one of these little points. And what that point is, is the fabric pleated over itself on the bottom. The way you fix that, and I think it's easier with a dampened toothpick, is that you reach inside that pleat and fan it open in one direction, and then you fan it open in the other direction, and you work it back and forth. I'm going to take that pin out. You work it back and forth until the pleat is no longer there on the back side of the fabric. And if I had my thread in here and I was sewing along, that would be a lovely outer curve. No, no point, easy to fix. What happens if you clip an outer curve? Let's say you put a clip here. And you're going along. I'm going to turn this under here. And then I'm going to turn this under here. And, and that's the same kind of folded over fabric on the other, underside, but it's not a pleat. So if I start reaching in to smooth that out, see how I've got all these seam allowances that are raw? Depending on how your fabric is going to behave and how likely it might be to fray at the end of that clip at the end, you can maybe make it be smooth, but it's just as likely that you will end up with a little hairy point there. And what if, instead of just one clip on that curve, you put in several? Because it's a big curve, right? So what if you've gone around this circle and you've clipped and you've clipped and you've clipped? That means that you'll be turning this under in segments. And you might be able to get it to be curved, but I can't see the benefit of running the risk of having little hairy points 
when it is just not that hard to deal with the pleats that would form if you didn't cut the seam allowance. Because on the underneath here, that's what you've got, all these little frayed clips. I'd rather not have little frayed clips on the underside. When you sew curves and circles the way I do, on the underside, that seam allowance is similar to the way a bottle cap would be if you could flatten it out. So there's equidistant pleats underneath. When you turn under these clipped edges and feel one side versus the other, they're not that different. There's still that much fabric turning underneath a smaller surface area. And I myself would much rather have a seam allowance that I know is going to hold together and not fray at the edge. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a cautious applicator. What can I tell you? Uh, I showed you on something that was almost a circle. This is going to be true on any outer curve. So if you look at, wait, I've got to go the other way. If you look at any of the curves in the quilt, behind me. Um, <laughs> you can tell I have directional problems when I, it's the mirrored thing. Um, any, whoop, any of those curves, there's no clipping. I never, never, never clip an outer curve. If you are going to clip an outer curve, if, if that's your thing, my strong advice is to keep the end of that clip pretty much well away from your folded edge or learn how to deal with the pleat. Okay, let's see, what other, what other thing did I want to say about that? I'm unsure. No, I am sure. Next thing I want to show you is how to clip an inner curve because inner curves are one of my most favorite things to applique. So here we go. I enjoy sewing inner curves. They're so graceful and they're so easy to turn. You do have to clip inner curves. No way around it. It's better to have a minimum of three clips, one at the deepest part of the curve and at least one on either side. Here, this is one long inner curve. I'm going to need more than three clips. Now, why three? Why not just one? If you do one clip on an inner curve, you can probably get it to round, but it looks more like a soft point than it does a curve. You have to think about the weave of the fabric and how deep the curve is. In a really deep curve, your clip will have to be deeper into the fabric and the two clips on either side will be a little shallower. If your fabric is really tightly woven, your clips will need to be a little deeper. Think like a batik and they'll need to be closer together because at the end of the clip, the fabric doesn't give as much. If your fabric is kind of average or looser, you can back your clips away from the line somewhat and put them a little bit farther apart. So you have to read the fabric. On all these shapes I've shown you, I have finger pressed the edge. So I have already finger pressed under that seam allowance on the far side of the chalk. I'm going to make my first clip at the deepest part of the curve right about there. Now remember, the seam allowance ends over there on the other side of the chalk. It's not right here, so I've, I've actually kept my clip a fair distance from the folded edge. Always turn your scissor so that it is at a 90 degree angle to the line you're going to turn with every clip. Here, where the inner curve is more acute, my clips are closer together, but I can make them a little farther apart where the curve softens out. <laughs> this is how you turn a curve. It's so much fun. Use your toothpick. It's way better than your needle because it's thick enough that it doesn't get caught in any one clip. Do not turn under one thing at a time. You'll end up with a more segmented look to your curve. 
place your toothpick at the far end of the curve, hold that end of the applique, and then sweep your toothpick down through the length of the curve. So it might look like I do this and then I start sewing. I do not do that. When it's time to clip any of these things, an inner point or an inner curve, you only clip when you absolutely have to. So here I would have started sewing there and I would have sewn to about there when if I turned under any more it would distort the fabric in that curve. Then I would turn and clip the way I showed you and use my toothpick to turn that under. If I were actually sewing this piece to the block, I would not clip it and then start sewing. I would have sewn here and gotten to about there. And when you can no longer turn the seam allowance under without distorting that fabric, then I would turn and clip the shape. I don't want to leave you with the idea that you clip before you sew. You don't do that because that would leave this too prone to fraying while you're doing the rest of your sewing. So on an inner point and on an inner curve, you clip when you have to and not before. You know, I could have threaded my needle and done some sewing and then shown you that part, but I was kind of in a hurry, and so I didn't. It was about clipping, so I kept the videos about the clipping. But do remember, you're sewing along, clip when you have to, and sew, and then if you have to clip some more, then you clip some more. On an inner curve, if it's long, you would do all those clips because you would turn them kind of all at once. All right, so there was that. I also left myself other notes. Oh, other notes. The toothpick that I'm using is a wooden toothpick. I get them at Cracker Barrel. Let me see if I hold my hand behind it. It has a little cute flat end and a pointed end. It's round and it's wood. You can find these at Asian grocery stores, at Walmart. They're, they're cute little toothpicks. Mostly, though, it's a round wooden toothpick. Whenever you're using the toothpick, uh, dampen it not with lipstick, but dampen it and then use it damp because the dampening raises the grain of the wood. It makes it work better. If you want to use a bigger, prettier tool, this one by Pearl Pereira is nice. And everything that I do with a toothpick, I can do with this. This is her applique pressing tool. So it has a point, but it also has the flat end. And I, I use the toothpick more but sometimes I use this for turning those things. This is really kind of nice on an inner curve because it's so much bigger. What else was I going to show you? Um, oh, I was going to show you this scissor that I forgot to include in the photograph, you know, earlier. This is Karen K. Buckley's Curved Perfect Scissor. It's got a little tiny, short, serrated blade. And it comes with this little curved plastic uh, sheath. This is really nice for clipping threads. Like if you're doing embroidery, which is why I pulled these out the other day and remembered I hadn't used them in a while. It's really nice for clipping embroidery threads because of the serration. It grabs the thread, but because it's curved just a little bit, you're not as likely to nick your uh, fabric. I use it more than for embroidery. I use it more for clipping the threads when I'm machine quilting and I'm pulling those threads through and up that I have to clip. Last thing, scissor sheaths. You know, you've got the scissors, they're good, you want to keep the points protected and besides it's cute. Um, whatever scissor sheaths you've got, use them. If you are in the market for cute ones, I have two sizes on the website in multiple colors. They're polka dots. More colors than this, but two sizes. So that's a lot of information about scissors. Um, really, there is a lot of information there. So when I started this half hour, <clears throat> excuse me, 
Oh, yeah, and I'm going to be almost right on it this time. <coughs> when I started this half hour, you knew what you knew about scissors. I hope that you picked up a few tips, maybe more than just a few. Maybe you picked up a lot of tips that um, tell you more about scissors. So enjoy your scissoring. Enjoy your, enjoy your clipping. I think that's all I got. So, oh, wait, this thing, I want to, I want to add this. That's my email. If you've got um, suggestions for future timeout topics, and somebody did. I had two or three people email me this morning with ideas that were really good. So I appreciate it. I am not going to run out of topics anytime soon. Um, that's where you can email me. And what's the other thing? Oh, I'm supposed to also tell you, Judy reminded me, scissor charms, scissor charms. I got them. I got some really cute ones. I have them in, they are all kinds of things. So there's like flower balls and there's little cats and there's dogs and there's animals. So scissor charms, you can get those at peaceofcake.com too. See, I didn't forget. So scissors, scissor sheath, scissor charms. I got you covered. Um, and I will see you next week on Wednesday at two o'clock when we have another time out together. Thank you for joining me and may you have many happy stitches. Have to find the off button. <laughs>